Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We spend literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and in today's episode, we have not one, but two special guests on the show, and we'll ask the question, can we still trust our eyes, or has the time come that we can no longer believe anything we see in a picture? Well, as Fox Mulder used to say, the truth is out there, right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 159. But hold on, if you enjoy this podcast, please join the Camera Shake community over on camerashakepodcast.com so that you're the first ones to know when we've got some exciting news for you. You'll find the link in the description, or if you're watching on YouTube, as always, if I don't forget to put it there, it'll be right down here somewhere on the screen. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the travel photographer, Northern Lights expert, and best-selling author, Dave Williams. And a little later on the show, We'll hear from AI expert Micah Burke, who will give us the latest news on whether robots are taking over the world or whether doomsday preparations can wait a little longer. Dave, I thought you were in Finland. I thought you said your guests were renowned photographers, and yet here I am. <laughs> Once again. Oh, God. <laughs> I've, I've lost count. Seven or eight. Well, probably somewhere around, there. somewhere around there. I've just noticed as well in the monitor how outrageously imbalanced my tan is. Oh no! Look at look at how much more color there is on my right arm than my left arm. I should do it that way around. I guess that's probably because you get your arm hanging out. But that's probably because I didn't go anywhere. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I feel a bit guilty. I went to Finland, but I didn't go to Finland. Right. I told it. So I've got what um, thirty-seven point four thousand Instagram followers who see me go to the Nordic countries and various other parts of the world all the time. And so I had this idea with all the emergence of AI imaging tech, including, and most notably at the moment, Adobe Firefly inside Adobe Photoshop, which has a generative, it drives the generative fill. Obviously there's Adobe Sensei, another kind of AI tech that drives other functions of Photoshop and other Adobe software. But Firefly's big news because and I explained this in my blog post recently that, that explained this Finland story as well. Essentially, Photoshop now does what non-photographers thought it did anyway, in that you can make a little selection and say, make that go away or add a raccoon here. And it does it. And that's what most people thought Photoshop did all along. But and now it actually does. Um, so with it being so simple, I wanted to, f I don't know, I didn't want to deceive anyone, but I knew I had to de deceive people in order to make the point that lots of stuff we're seeing is not real. And um, at the moment, social media is full of fake pictures, fake pictures claiming to be historically accurate, like loggers from a hundred years ago cut down a tree the size of a house with like a saw this big but the tree stumps the size of the house and you see a picture of this big tree but there's no stump in the ground it looks real but if you look at it it's not it can't be real same with like i don't know 15 foot tall people um just standing in the high street in a black and white photo or like famous figures from history in peculiar situations there's all this fakeness going on so i wanted to show how everyday people this guy could use ai tech to deceive people in a light-hearted way that wasn't going to cause any damage and the point that i would make from that is that there are loads of people doing this in a way that isn't lighthearted, in a way that there is damage. And it could be changing the course of history kind of damage because you're creating fake photos of historical situations. Or it could be psychological damage because you're creating people that don't exist and perhaps like bikini models or something, these kind of people that don't exist. And people are aspiring to be the people they see in pictures. Well, if the people they're seeing in pictures aren't real at all, it's not like they haven't been photoshopped. They're just not real. 
So yeah, I wanted to go away. I wanted to prove the point that anyone could do it. I made a series of pictures. I say, I, we made a series of pictures. Um, and the results were quite interesting because of those 37,000 followers, 13 photos posted over three days. One person said something. One person called Darren over in Australia looked at the picture of me standing outside the cabin. You know that one? And he wrote, this looks fake. Smiley emoji. That was it. That was the only person that called me out on this crazy experiment. And if you look at the photos properly, you can see they're fake, all of them. At a glance, they look genuine. But if you look at any of them in any detail, you can see how fake they are. And in some cases, we did that on purpose. We left in some not so obvious, but not so obvious errors, but obvious if you pay attention. You know what I mean? Like the, the handle missing of the coffee cup. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the medium that we chose to present these images, which was basically Instagram story. Instagram story. It you can know, be passed off easily. Yeah. yeah, and I think the danger is that, especially with things like stories, for example, or even TikToks or something, you know, you only look, you're only looking at an image for such a short amount of time before you flick on to the next thing. Yeah. And that, of course, aids, you know, the deceptor in, in a sense. So if I'd posted that as a proper Instagram post or on Facebook or any Flickr or anywhere where you're, oh, where on you're your posting website. a property, exactly, yeah. anywhere like that, then it would have been immediately called out as fake. And the reason I opted to do it as an Instagram and Facebook story is because that's what like if I was to go to Finland, firstly, it would be entirely plausible that I would suddenly be in Finland. Yeah. It's a two and a half hour flight. It's in a country that an area of the world that I enjoy. And it's something you do all the time. Anyway. Something I do. Yeah. So that's plausible first off. And that's where, that's an important thing when it comes to um, deceptions like that is that they need to be based in reality to yeah, some yeah, degree. Yeah. And of course, yeah, the fact that you are a travel photographer, you do specialize in Nordic countries and the mm -hmm. Arctic and so you know and so on, so it's entirely plausible mm. that you would go to Finland. We yeah. see you in Scandinavian countries all the time. Yeah, I was in Iceland last week, really in Iceland, yeah. actual Iceland, not fake Iceland. And of course, you know, I went to Sweden only a couple of weeks ago, which would have probably been the first time that I was in Scandinavia and you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but the point I was making about um, having having it anchored there is because it would be plausible for me to go there and most people flick through Instagram stories. And so they're not going to be studying the image. The image is on a smaller screen, so it gives them less opportunity to study. But when we talk about the first photo in a second, if you go and look at my Instagram story, I Dave Williams on Instagram, at the first picture where I'm in the airport, I was with that particular picture and others throughout this story, I was able to use the sticker features on Instagram, like the location and the temperature and, you know, all those things to distract you. So on the one in the airport, I said, where do you think I'm going? And I put Iceland option A, Finland option B and Timbuktu option C. So the sticker distracted people, the Timbuktu option distracted people, so people were voting for Timbuktu. And the call and of it, action. And it distracted general. you from the fact that the, yeah. the seat looks absolutely outrageous. And if you are listening to the audio <laughs> version of this, I highly recommend you head over to uh, either Dave's Instagram, which we will put in the description, which is iDave Williams. iDave Williams, yeah. yeah. And so if you go to the stories at the top of the account, I've called it vacation, spelt V-A-I-cation. Um, or, of course, if you are on YouTube um, and you're watching this on YouTube at the moment, then I will be flying the, the images on the screen um, in just a second. So you'll be able to see what we're talking about on YouTube. Um, likewise, you could head over to Camera Check Podcast um, group on Facebook, uh, where we'll post all the images as well, just so we can discuss them there as well. Um, but the first image, we're talking about an image of Dave sitting in the departure lounge at some airport and uh i was sitting on the bench right over there next to kirsten's dining table yes so all the images <laughs> so just just as a little bit of a description just for clarity so the image all the images as they were presented in the <clears throat> in the final in the final form were all fake uh, with the exception 
of that, me of of Dave, who we shot either in my house or in a park down the road. So Dave was real; everything else was fake. And so, of course, we thought in advance. We thought about what kind of images we we're going to create, mm -hmm. um, and then we shot. Or I shot Dave in those positions. So the first image that you're looking at, uh, where Dave is sitting on a bench um, inside of the departure lounge, he's actually sitting on a wooden bench in my dining room. Mm -hmm. That was it. So if we look at this picture, my posing was, so Kirsten took the picture of me on my iPhone. My posing was, I'm sitting on a um, departure lounge and I'm looking up towards the information board. So it's a picture of a non-event. It's just a picture. And the reason is to set the scene. The reason I wanted to include this was to set the scene because Let's be honest, in a day of social media, you don't really go anywhere unless you check in at the airport. You've got to check in on Facebook at the airport and then you, then you go somewhere. So we started at the airport. I tell you what I love about this picture is it's not only that it it's creates, terrible. Well, it, I love oh, it. it is pretty terrible, but <laughs> I mean, it also it put a backpack and an iPhone. No, I did that. On the seat next. Oh, did you do it? Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, you know, the newspaper on the floor, the backpack, the iPhone, I did that. If you look properly at the backpack, you'll notice that it looks like a very big chunky backpack. But then if you look at the seat it's sitting on, there's absolutely no depth to the backpack in relation to the back of the seat. But then also look at the chair properly. It's a funny shape. The armrests are funny shapes. The perspective is all wrong. That wrong perspective is reflected in the windows behind me. If you look through the windows, there's nothing really there. It's just a mass of reflections. There's a table on the end of the bench to the side of me. I put a coffee cup on it. I thought that drew too much attention to the bad table. So I removed the coffee cup again. But what it did do a really good job of is that girl in the background with a suitcase. I think I selected that area and the only prompt I wrote was Traveller. And that's what we got. That's pretty good. So all of this was done in Photoshop hmm. using generative fill. Yep. Um, and although it's not perfect, it does show that you can get away with a lot. I mean, especially if, you know, if you're trying to deceive somebody, then it's, it's relatively easy to do just by drawing the attention to where you want it to be. And again, yeah. the only real thing in this in this photograph is, is you. Yeah. And all the attention is drawn to you in a sense yeah. and everything because else. Because I'm... I'm front and center. I'm yeah. looking up, so people are like, the, the, your mind as a viewer is going, "What's he looking at?" So it's thinking rather than analyzing the rest of the scene, because the rest of the scene just sort of blends into that. Exactly, it's bland and boring. The only thing that would sort of distract your eye from yourself is that girl in the background. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it's just a little detail, and you know that rendered really quite well. It was also a test to see how well generative fill. Badly. Can perform. Well, badly. badly, but good enough. The biggest problem I had with this picture is the bit between my legs. That bit of the of the seat between my legs was out of line with the seat outside of my legs. But every time I selected that area and tried to get the prompt correct to fill it in and to make it level, to make it the same texture and colour as the rest of the seat... I got an error message because Adobe had Adobe's AI um, philosophy is very ethical, very safe. And so they quite famously trained their models using ethically sourced images that they own rather than trawling the internet like lots of other companies. But also they're protecting users with the things that they create, nothing adult rated, no guns, no knives, things like that. Because I'd selected an area that the AI had quite clearly noticed was between my legs and there was some skin there on my hands, it didn't want to put anything there. It just kept saying, nope, not putting anything there. And I just had a wonky seat that was out of line. I just wanted to bring it in line, but it wouldn't do it. I had to trick it into doing it because it thought I was up to something dodgy. Do you think that's the old no nipples rule? It, it's the 2023 version, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's have a look at the next picture. The next picture is basically you're on the plane. I was sat right here where you're sitting now. Exactly. So you're in the image, you're on a plane, you're in your plane seat, the windows on the side. 
Um, you're kind of glancing over to maybe the seat in front of you. Uh, you can see uh, the overhead lockers um, behind you. You can see another seat and some more windows in the mm -hmm. background. It looks, again, if you look at that in passing, this will completely mm -hmm. pass as you just taking a selfie on the plane. Exactly. It, again, a situation that we come across all the time. I mean, people do yeah. take pictures. I, of I take that picture. The, the, when you're sitting on an airplane by the window, it's a, it's like a huge softbox is right beside your face. It's, you get beautiful light. It's a great selfie light. So that's what I did. I sat right next to the softbox that's currently over our heads for the video and um, took a selfie. You know, what I love, it, you know what I love about this is it's actually the composition is totally crap as well. And that's what you usually find. Everything's terrible. Usually when people take pictures of themselves on the plane, that's what you get. Yeah, quite. Yeah. It's, you know. So um, the notable things for me in this picture are the fact, as you pointed out, there's overhead lockers. Well, they shouldn't be there. That should be like a flat panel with a cool button and an air vent. It's generally not like black. It's usually the same color as the walls. It almost looks as if the lockers are on the side where the wall is, perspective-wise. The, the, the window is a strange shape and a strange position. The chair has two backs to it. There's all kinds of things wrong with this picture, but it looks like a plan. You look at this seam that goes down and hits the hat, but then doesn't continue beyond the hat in the wall. There's, lots There's of so much wrong with this picture, but at a glance, you're not looking at the yeah. picture. You're looking at me on a plane. Yeah. Your your mind tricks you and goes, "Your Dave's on a plane." I mean, unless you're unless you're in the mindset of trying to figure out what is wrong with it, mm -hmm. you know, it's like where's Waldo, basically. Mm. Then you know you wouldn't think twice. No. And what was the prompt for this one? Airplane. I think it was just airplane. I mean, that's, that's the other interesting thing. You know, the prompt was simply airplane, yeah. and it knew to put you inside of it because airplane. it was a cause because we'd selected me. Yeah. So it knew it's a person and the prompt is airplane yeah it's probably going to be put the person inside the airplane otherwise you know, could have just could have put an put airplane you, behind me yeah, or put you on the wing of an airplane would, or something that would have been airport yeah so again very interesting but it it worked in terms of moving the story along mm -hmm. you know so we're at the airport now we're on a plane yeah okay so where am i going because because the, the question i asked in the first one was where am i going then I could do the arriving and the suspense building, people going to check whether they were right, whether I was actually going to Timbuktu. Yeah. No, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> in fact, the first thing you did when you were out in Finland, <clears throat> quite clearly you got yourself of course, a coffee. Of course, obviously that would be the first thing. I've got a coffee right here. It's not your standard coffee, but it's a coffee. That would be the first thing I would do. So that's the first thing we did in the story. This, this podcast is not sponsored by Tim Hortons. Not yet. Although it should be. Not yet. <laughs> um, this picture. So this is outrageous because this was the first one we did. And this is the, this is outrageous to me because it did so well. So that cup has a big logo on it and has a lid on it in okay, real life. And it's right. taken on the forecourt of a gas station. Let's just let's just describe the image as we see it at the moment. So we'll, what we're looking at is basically Dave holding up a cardboard coffee cup, um, standing by the side of a country road in what appears to be some form of Scandinavian country. Finland. Finland, yeah. It's got spruce and birch. Yeah. And it, it's Finland. So it's a nice day, apparently. You know, it's a little bit sunny, nice sky. And it's the typical look at my coffee type of shot. Again, fairly stereotypical shot. Um, of course, the only thing that's real in this image is your hand and Partially the coffee. Half of the cup. Uh, half of the cup, yeah. So, <clears throat> again, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll fly in um, the, the original image so you can compare them. Uh, in the original image, first of all, that copper cup had a lid. Yep. And it had a logo on it. Yep. And you weren't by the side of a road no. in Finland. You were actually at a gas station yep. in Rickmansworth. Yep. So, the new object select tool uses AI to find objects. So we're still using AI. Selected my hand and the cup and my arm and then inverted the selection. I don't think I even feathered it. I just literally inverted it. And um, the prompt was looking down, something like looking down a road in Finland in spring, something like that. 
And the roads it gave me were crazy. This one's crazy, but it's less notably crazy. So, so there were strange shapes and strange patterns and like all this stuff. We ended up with this one, which looks like a footpath and then a grass median and, and then the road. But when you look at it properly, you'll notice that everything is completely in the wrong proportion for that to be the case. But at a glance, it looks fine. So I left it in there as a deliberate thing to see if anyone would call it out. And they didn't. Um, there's a strange line running down the road as well. And for the, one of the one of the images that I was considering posting, um, we put a cyclist way off in the distance, but it just looked too good. It was too sharp, yeah. too much color, too big. And so we cut that out. So the other thing I wanted to do was... That was a gas station coffee, Wild Bean Cafe, which is a BP coffee. And so I had to remove the logo from the cup. I used the remove tool, AI again. You just draw over it and it disappears. And I took the cup off, uh, the lid off the cup, which was, I made a selection over the top of the cup. And the prompt I wrote was coffee. I think it was just the word coffee. And it took the lid off and showed coffee inside the cup. We're, I mean, diff we're different variations. Yeah, we're different variations of coffee as well. Yeah. Remember, with milk, One, without milk. Yeah, we went for the you know black coffee, not too fancy with you know drawing on the milk or whatever. One of them added a finger. I remember that. Okay. One of them added a finger. Other than that, they were all great. This was just the best of them. A funny side note about this image. Mm. So when I showed this to my daughter, the first thing she did was. She looked at this little area here, just the side of the cup, just above your thumb. Yeah. And there's a tiny little kink in it. Yeah. There's and kinks, she... and kinks all over it. And it's like, the cup's like twisted. Yeah. <laughs> so she looked at that kink and went, well, that's fake. Yeah. <laughs> but she had to zoom in all the way, you know? Yeah. So um, again, one of these things, if you just saw that on somebody's story. There's also whatever that is down the road. That's like a, is it like a road sign or something? Yeah, I think it's a road sign, a nondescript road sign. Right, right leave it, whatever. Could have taken it out, decided not to. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, when you see that in a story on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. Um, You'd expect a lack of detail in, yeah. the, in the detail. All right, so let's move on to the next image. So on this image, you are by a lake. Yeah, I'd arrived. It was land of the midnight sun. So uh, I <clears throat> actually want to touch on something else, if you don't mind. Choosing Finland made sense because not many people have been versus other countries that I go to, like Iceland and Norway. And there are far more um, famous, recognizable, iconic locations in Finland, uh, in Norway, Sweden, even um, Faroe Islands, uh, Iceland, places like that that I would have gone. Whereas Finland has got a lot more sort of open tundra, open plains that you can get away with <clears throat> making a location that's not like not a famous location, not a specific location. However, it is recognizably Finnish. And so none of these places are iconic places. We haven't faked famous places, famous waterfalls. No. We've just made generic Finland. And so this is... Finland, I think, has the most lakes in the world or something, or so, something, lots of lakes. And so here I am by a lake in the evening, high up, not in the Arctic, somewhere where it's kind of getting twilight, because right now the sun doesn't set in the Arctic, showing that it's still light in the middle of the night and I've been on the road all day. Poor me, here's my legs by a lake. <laughs> so there we are. Again, not unusual. Not unusual. And I think the point about not using recognizable locations or using pretty generic yeah. um, locations. Because, I mean, this could be a lake in Sweden. It could be. It could be a lake in, in Germany, actually. From, yeah. You know, um, it could be a lake in California. <clears throat> mm. You know. No, no barbecues, no bears. <laughs> no, no bears, uh, no raccoons. No raccoon. Well, that was a mistake, obviously. <laughs> should, should have put a raccoon in, in every image. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, the fact that these locations are so generic... Uh, basically means that virtually nobody would recognize those. And if somebody did, you'd know they're lying. Yeah. Because... Well, I've been there. No, you haven't. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the original image was obviously not shot by a lake. It was shot down the road in the park. 
I sat on a bench, put my feet out in front of me and took a picture. And I didn't know exactly what I was going to put in front of my feet. I just knew I needed to be in the picture so my feet would be fine. My feet would be the yeah. thing of me in the picture. So that's the only thing that's real. Everything else is fake. It's even created shadows <clears throat> on the rocks yeah. um, where you'd expect you know, the sh shadows to be. So it's it's done a remarkably good job. Um, I think, you know, color wise, it fits as well. I changed the color on the original because I'm, when we shot the original picture, it was midday, very bright, yeah. hard light. So I warmed it up a bit. I kept the hardness, but I warmed it up a bit. And that's one of the things that um, Generative Phil is so good at as well, is, is reading the, the light. The, the, the textures yeah. and the lighting are the two best things, in my opinion, so far. Bearing in mind, we haven't even had this for a month. And it's still beta. I think, I think it's those two things that it's yeah. best at. It's terrible with eyes, human faces, hands, most animals. And it's also, it's too smart, which makes it bad. So it won't put something completely out of place somewhere. It will think around what fits in the scene it's creating. And there was this one picture that... Um, I was looking out of the cabin door, which was looking through your kitchen door. And when I did the cabin shot, looking at the cabin over my shoulder, I had a gravel path going through some tundra. And when I shot out the door, I needed to reverse that view. Mm. So I needed to sort of engineer that view backwards to try and deceive people. But it wouldn't add the path going away because the tundra it had created for that version of the view would not have gravel in real life mm. and so it wouldn't add it it was too smart to completely fake a situation that just would not happen so i had to trick it and i only got a bit of gravel and it was the wrong color so it's too smart for its own good i want to tell it what i want it to put there and i want it to just do it without question mm. <clears throat> but yeah lighting texture absolutely nails those in most situations and at some point, you're going to have to go and get something to eat. Oh, there's <clears throat> there's no doubt on any um, trip you see me on, on Facebook, Instagram, wherever, YouTubes, there's always going to be food and or coffee. So I had to make some coffee, obviously. And some food. And uh, so this picture, what you're, what you're seeing is you're seeing a bowl with some kind of, I don't know, ragu, meat, meat broth. Meat broth in it. Uh, you can see there's a coffee cup, uh, there's a glass with ice cubes in it, uh, there's a spoon and a slate with some, I don't know, whatever it is. Some leafy thing and some butter. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, so all things that you would find, yeah. you know, in uh, in the north. Yep. Yeah. Um, Reindeer much. stew. Yeah. Moose, moose stew, whatever. So it's a typical top-down shot of yeah. whatever it is that you're eating. But of course... None of that was really there. None of that was there. Because the thing that because we really shot was... We shot straight down onto that table in the background. Straight down with nothing on the table. Nothing. Yeah, it was a completely empty table. Uh, in fact, you know, we could have used any old wooden backdrop type of image. We, To be honest, we probably didn't even need to start with anything. We exactly, probably yeah. could have just written wooden tabletop. Oh, yeah. Or on a document. blank yeah. on a blank document exactly <clears throat> i'm going to point out some things the glass with ice the bottom and the top don't match the top doesn't sort of line up with the glass on the side the coffee cup there's no handle i added space for a handle but it didn't give me a handle so i was like all right I'll leave that and see if anyone calls me out on it. Of course, the, the handle could be... <clears throat> could be on the other side, yeah. but with your, you know, with the coffee art, you'd expect it to be on the right there. Um, the um, spoon. It looks like it's got the reflection of, like, clamshell, top-down clamshell studio lighting. <laughs> it also looks a little bit bent, but it might It does be. look... It looks very bent. Those are the main things, but then there are lots of other smaller details as well. I ended up with... Um, on that slate board, see, I had a hard time getting slate in there in that shape, in that position, mm. because it was it was smarter than it, it, me. 
and so it wouldn't do it so it took me about nine goes to get that piece of slate there and then i added on top of it i originally wanted bread and butter and i found out bread and butter was really awkward it's not very good at that yet like sliced bread or whatever it made it the wrong shape the wrong patterns in the top of the bread the wrong lighting on the cut bread so i ended up just saying food and it gave me butter and the leaves which it's a weird thing but they both look convincing so i let the meat stew and the coffee sort of take the limelight and have that just off the edge and seeing if anyone would notice they didn't but we did two versions of this that was my version mm -hmm. i want to hear about your version and why you put what where and what you think about it i mean i have to say generally speaking um if, if i if i look at all of the images that we created um that was probably one the one image that sort of screamed fake to me the most okay you know both of the food images in my mind that would have been the first thing i would have called out is that because we both sat at the computer staring at them for so long no i don't think so i think it's they just there's just something not quite real about them right. each individual component looks pretty possible like if you look at the you know the food itself it looks fine the glass on its own looks fine um in in the shot the alternative shot that i did um there's a piece of bread on the top right hand side that looks fine and everything but when you look at it and a spoon looks fine as well but if you look at it all together there's just something there that just doesn't it's hard to describe but it doesn't it kind of looks plastic yeah it looks like some of these it looks pasted on mm -hmm. to a degree you know so i'm thinking out of all of the images that would have probably been the one where you know where i would thought well it's, it's just you know maybe it's but interestingly like i said at, right at the start that wasn't the one that got called out no of course not and the thing is again it just goes to show that you know, when you just see something in passing mm -hmm. you know and you might even think it but then your logical mind will sort of override that mm -hmm. and you'd be like well, well but, why, he said he's, but he said he's in finland yeah and i know he's in be. finland because i've seen the other I picture saw the other picture yeah. yeah yeah so i had um oh so we had dinner with steve brazel from behind the shot podcast yeah. and that was on saturday i did this last week on tuesday wednesday and thursday the three days that i was in finland and um when we when we met Steve, he he said, "I thought you'd gone to Finland and forgotten we had dinner plans and that we, I wasn't going to see you." And yeah. Like, nope. Sorry, it's all fake. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was very sorry. interesting. Yeah. It, it definitely, you know, it, it goes to show that with re relatively little effort and the technology that we have available to us mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. it is relatively easy to convincingly fool someone into yeah. thinking yeah. whatever it is you want them to think yeah you know in this case and it's not always going to be as i'm sorry it's not always going to be as light-hearted as what we've done absolutely it and can it, be bad and of course we came clean at the end we came clean immediately yeah, apologized i put it out on my socials my blog diy photography wrote about it we're talking about it we're getting it out there and also um i just want to while we're on that there's a, a thing called the content authenticity initiative which is almost a charitable independent thing um adobe have partnered with it and the point of this sort of organization is to point out the fake situations that sometimes happen through manipulated images and video like bodies that aren't real like good looking people that have been um adjusted to look that good looking that aren't real and the idea that perhaps there should be more control more warnings about things like this to say this image has been manipulated um so if you're interested in that sort of a thing look up the content authenticity initiative um, and you'll get loads of information about this because it is, is a huge issue, a huge issue. And it's, it's going to become even huger now that this technology is available to anyone and everyone. Yeah. And um, there are apps, aren't there? You, like, I'm seeing there. adverts on TikTok and Instagram for iPhone apps that are um, generative text to image, AI image generators. And like, it's so it's not you don't even know how you don't even have to know how to use photoshop or how to use the stable diffusion models in their 
various interfaces. You just you just open it up and type. Talking about stable diffusion, there were a few images that were generated from scratch. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we thought about this and we thought like who could we ask to do that for we us? We could try and do it, or we could ask an expert. We could ask the expert <laughs> in the field. And uh, that's when we called Micah Burke up and Micah Burke's been on the show um a little while ago, I think back in November. It's episode one hundred and thirty. The link is up here if you're interested. But Micah How do you know all these episodes? You always say episode number blah off the top of your head and point <laughs> And it blows me away because I'm so weird. I'm well prepared. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so we, of course, we went and we asked Micah, and he was happy to help us out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I spoke to Micah only a few hours ago, and here's what he had to say about the images that he created from scratch: blank canvas. There was nothing there, and everything that you're seeing in these images is entirely fake. How did you do it? Well, let's find wait, out. Wait, wait. I'm not fake. Let's find out. Hey, Micah, how's it going? Doing good. How are you guys? Uh, absolutely excellent, man. It's cool, it? been it's been a minute and a half since we spoke. We spoke last time. I want to say it was the end of November, beginning of December, something like that. Last year, we we did a whole episode about about AI back then. Yeah, I think it was November, but uh, it might have aired in December. But yeah, we uh, we talked extensively about the. Uh, the world of AI at that point, which has dramatically changed once again. It's, you know, it was amazing when we spoke back then. Um, I remember, you know, uh, Nick and I did an episode in August talking about DALI uh, because it was big in the news back then. And of course, by the time that we spoke, um, that was already yesterday's news because it had moved on so far since then. And I remember you saying, you know, this is like the progress is exponential. So give it a few months and we're going to be, you know, we're going to be talking about something completely different. And of course, here we are now. I mean, little did we know. I don't think we could have foreseen back then in November that we would have something like, you know, generative fill AI available to us at the drop of our hat in Photoshop, inside of Photoshop. I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah, I I had been using some third-party plugins to pull stable diffusion images into Photoshop in the past. And uh, I did a... Uh, recently was at Creative Pro Week and gave a presentation on doing that. At the same time, Generative Fill had just come out, so I had to re- recreate my presentation on the fly just because of that. Um, yeah, it's I really like the way Adobe's added it in there. It, it has a really nice interface. It's extremely easy to use, and I think it produces pretty good results, as, uh, as folks will probably see. Yeah, I mean, the results have been really amazing. Not only, you know, not only in generating brand new worlds or adding objects that weren't there before, but just simply, you know, in simple things like, you know, object removal, for example, you know, I a B tested that against some of the other tools, um, in Adobe. And I have to say generative fill was just crazy in removing objects and, and really not leaving a trace of anything behind it was, you know, it's mind blowing. Yeah. In the past, you know, uh, positors and photographers had to use, Tools like uh, frequency separation to to really recreate areas of an image that they've removed. This does such a great job. There's almost very little, uh, almost no cleanup that you have to do in many cases. Exactly. And of course, that really got us to the point um, where, you know, Dave came to me and said, look, I've got this idea about faking a vacation, you know, um, create a number of images and we'll just pretend to be abroad in Finland, as it happened. Um, and so, you know, he came over to my place. We shot a whole bunch of, I call them background plates because that's really for all intents and purposes. That's, that's all they were. Um, so we shot a bunch of background plates at my house and at a park, literally two minutes walk from my house. And then we continued to fake everything around them. And of course, you've been involved in that. Um, you've taken on some of the heavy lifting in those images. So what I want to do with you is I want to go through some of the images that you've worked on. And um, I want to talk about what you did, how you got the result, how easy or how difficult it may have been to, uh, to make that convincing. And, you know, uh, so that we, that we could fool the general public. Okay. Awesome. All right. So we're going to start with the first image. Um, The first image is the image of Dave at a lake 
in front of some finished pines, I guess. <laughs> you know, we get some rocks on the floor um, and some, you know, grass and everything else. A nice nature picture, obviously. Dave's looking longingly into the distance. And it looks like he's actually there. So how did you generate that image? Yeah, so it was actually fairly easy, apart from matching up his feet, uh, as his feet were in some grass, and so there were blades of grass that are surrounding it. Um, so what I did is I used, I pulled the image into uh, Photoshop. I did a select subject, which selected uh, Dave pretty well, and then I actually um, used, in Photoshop, you're able to take a selection and reduce the selection down, and I can track it. Can, press the selection down a bit around him, ran a generative fill on a new layer and created the background. And uh, I think the first set gave me at least one that was perfect. Um, from there, all I had to do was add something to kind of hide his feet a bit. And so that little rock area there got added in. It's just another generation. The cool thing about generative fill is that it looks at the existing image that it's going to be generating from and tries to match the lighting and the colors pretty well. And I was really impressed with how, how quickly and easily it worked. Yeah, that's the thing that really blew my mind. You know, when I first started testing on Gentry Phil, is the way that it reads the original lighting in the image and how it matches everything to that. That was just, you know, I mean, how many hours of compositing would that save you, you know, just to get it that, that right? Yeah, the, the, the hours of compositing, the, the times that you have to go and do... Uh a camera raw and, and edit the image a bit and then add layers of uh, adjustment layers. And yeah, the, the, the only thing I did find that was kind of necessary was um, adding a bit of noise to the image, the, the images that were being created by generative fill, because I thought they were a little soft. And I think that's simply just because generative fills resolutions, uh, 1024 by 1024. So when you're blowing it up to the full size of an iPhone screen, it kind of loses some of the resolution and gets a little fuzzy. Um, I, I tried a couple of different tricks for that. One of them was I actually took a couple of photos, a light photo and a dark photo with my uh, iPhone, got those two images and threw them together on top of them. And they did pretty good, but I still wanted to add a little additional noise to kind of get that uh, that authentic look and feel to it. That's a very well-known trick in composing generally is we add noise to blend things together because very often, you know, images are generally noisy to some degree. I mean, even if, you know, even if you shoot at like ISO, 100 and there's always noise some degree of noise in the image and when we you know when we create um areas within that image i'm thinking like a good example would be um when i composite out license plates on cars that's a really good example so i'm replacing that area with just paint for example right i mean in order for that to look realistic i need to add grain so that it seamlessly blends in all the areas around it because that's where we naturally find the actual grain in the photo and so matching that and making sure it looks um looks like it should that it basically hides to a degree it hides what's underneath and it just really helps blending things in yeah, a lot of compositing and, and photo editing is about hiding um uh, things that don't necessarily need to be there. Um, one of the things I really like about generative fill is that you're able to select something in an image and just remove it. And it actually seamlessly replaces that with, with background information. And I did use that in this case on a, uh, in a couple of the photos that we did. Yeah. I mean, generative fill, although it takes, I mean, at the moment it takes longer because it's using, you know, Adobe's supercomputers, you know, online and all that. Um, of course it's not quite as quick, um, as some of the other tools. But it's totally worth it, you know, most of the time. I think it's about as fast as uh, a local installation of Stable Diffusion and using a plugin. I, I think it's just about as fast. Um, I think they're going to have to ramp up their server load uh, as time progresses and more people get a hold of this. You know, when uh, when they first launched beta, so within the first day or two, uh, when I was, you know, I was, I was, I was testing it, um, I constantly kept getting warning messages saying, like, that's it, our system's overloaded. <laughs> You know, try again later. <laughs> yeah, talk about warning messages. I did get a few when I was trying to create paths and the roads and things that it, it didn't really recognize what I was doing and thought I was doing something illegal. So it was telling me not to do that, warning me uh, that it that it, I was violating the terms of agreement by doing this. And uh, I was kind of amused. But again, it is still in beta. And I think it's going to get a lot better as time progresses. I mean, with the results that we're getting now, it's impressive. Just imagine in a few months what it's going to be like. 
Exactly. We're still in beta. Like people have to remember that we're still in beta. This isn't even part of the official, you know, public version of Photoshop yet. And also, uh, again, just, you know, take it back to November. I mean, we were talking, we were talking about AI in November and where are we now? And only a few months later, this is like, you know, um, this is nothing compared to what's to come. I'm sure. Well, we'll yeah, it's pretty on. crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's, absolutely. Um, I just want to fly in the original image. Um, it's just so that people see how much that image has changed. So remember the original, the doctored image showed Dave uh, at a lake in Finland. And here is the original image where Dave's, well, he's in a park near my house. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it, it was an interesting image. I got that and I'm trying to understand exactly what we wanted. Um, I thought, you know, this kind of looks, reminds me of, of a pose I would make when I was at a nice lake here in California. And so, uh, selecting him and then allowing it to contract, contract the, uh, the mask a bit and then ran the gender to fill, uh, it was pretty much right out the, right off, right out of the gate, ready to go. Um, really impressive results for, uh, for first, first time. Yeah. Let's move on to the second image. So the second image shows Dave in front of a Finnish waterfall. Yep. Uh, again, it was pretty straightforward. Again, I selected Dave and uh, I did have to do a little extra editing on this one and compress it more and then mask him in a bit as the waterfall kind of matched with him some and it didn't look quite as realistic. Um, I think I also did a little bit of color adjustment on there just to get it right. Again, Jenner DeFill did a great job of uh, putting him in the right place at the right time and the, I think the colors and the lighting looks pretty good. And I think if, if you just saw this, image like you know flashing by on your phone as it was intended of course for this whole um vacation uh, project um you really you wouldn't be able to tell that that's not real no it looks like he was really there yeah i think it helps that i took a bad photo with bad hard light with a shadow i think that adds to the realism because why would you fake that yeah, it, it does. There is one issue, though, and that's that with generative fill, since I think it's pulling mostly from Adobe stock, a lot of what it's pulling are dramatic and well-shot photos. So when you're really wanting something that looks uh, off-the-cuff, selfie kind of image, you have to play with it a bit and, um, and add a little extra noise and a little blur just to get that look and feel. So you just mentioned um, that Adobe essentially pull the original image content from their own collection um, of stock photos. Why is that? And why do other, you know, other companies scour the internet for just about any random photo? So Adobe's concern is, is authenticity and then making sure that people are getting uh, not just paid for, but so Adobe's concern is that they're within copyright law and any, any additional copyright law that comes down the road, that they're going to be compliant with that. And I think they're also concerned about creators' rights and making sure creators have control over their own content. Um, other systems like Stable Diffusion or Mid Journey have scraped the internet and have pulled all this data in. The different models in Mid Journey are great and they're really useful for doing specific types of uh, imagery versions, straight photographic images. But they're being scraped from, you know, websites where people are posting their own photos or from, you know, the Google searches in itself. So Adobe's really interested in making sure that folks are properly authorized for these images, that these images are sourced. Um, how would you put it? Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Ethically. That's the word. So Adobe's really interested in making sure these images are sourced ethically and that the copyrights are being violated. You know what this reminds me of? That reminds me of the whole Napster situation back in the early, early 2000s. You know, Napsters, Napster, a music platform uh, where people could download random music without any, you know, I mean, totally infringing copyright laws all over the world, you know, and there was no zero control. Um, and of course, you know, that's led to, you know, Spotify and Apple Music that, that we enjoy today, where at least there's, eh, to some small degree, a recompense to the actual original artist. I mean, you know, it's almost laughable because it's a very small degree, but you know, at least there is some 
recompense rather than no recompense. I agree to an extent. I think folks need to recognize that what the AI systems are doing is they're not compositing images as you and I might if we were to go out and take a bunch of photos or scour the internet and take photos and composite them together. Um, that's sort of a common misconception about AI is that that's all it's doing is compositing images. So for example, if I take a picture of, you know, a thousand cats and then I composite a brand new cat out of that, that would be a composite. What the AI is actually doing is looking at the images and learning what a cat is in all three dimensions. So that when you tell the AI, hey, I want a new cat and I want the, this color cat and I want it this size, etc., the AI is generating a cat that no one's ever seen before. And it's not using a single pixel of anyone else's data. Now, whether or not that's an, an ethical issue about copyright, I, I think there's a good argument there. But at the same time, I think we have to recognize that this is a completely different um, way of looking at things. And it's not really going to fit any mold that we quite have yet. And that's, of course, something that may very well change. Copyright law may may be amended in the future. Who knows? You know, but, but where we are at the moment, this is really something that kind of, sort of sits. It's a very gray area. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think it's going to change uh, laws as well as our universe. I, I think this is a, I think AI and AI generative systems are going to be a nuclear like change in our society. And I think we're still not even close to understanding what the repercussions are going to be. And of course, it extends not only to imagery, but also to, you know, music, as we mentioned, I mentioned before, um, AI generated music is already a thing and it is pretty mind blowing, you know. And, you know, I remember actually years ago, yes. this goes back years, um, where an algorithm was trained to compose classical orchestral music <laughs> in the style of Mozart, Brahms, Beethoven, so on, so on, so forth. And the results, Bach, you know, and the results were tremendous. And this goes back at least, I would say, from a top of my head, probably four, five maybe six years or something. And I remember even back then people think, wow, this is like, what is going on here? This wasn't presumably, this, this probably wasn't AI as we understand it now, but very clever algorithms that have, but nevertheless, they had been taught on, or they had been trained on, you know, the, the pieces and the music and the compositional styles of all those masters and could then basically imitate that to really great effect. Yeah. And now we have AI that's trained on the music of Drake and can replace her, replace him. <laughs> Well, <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's uh, take a look. Let's uh, have a look at the original waterfall image. So that was, well, it was shot in front of a little skate park around the corner from my house. So <laughs> a skate park that doubles for a waterfall. There you go. It was that easy. And in actual fact, in fact, it was, it was shot on an iPhone as well. That was the other thing. It was, you know, there was no, no thought, even the, even the horizon isn't straight. Nothing's nothing's good about this photo whatsoever. Well, from from a compositor's point of view, I think what is good about the photo is that um, you know we had good lighting in the sense that uh, you know you got that direct lighting line on the space. It's real harsh, so that it's going to bring out that real sunshiny day kind of photo that we're going to be able to get with the, uh, the generative layer and the generative fill. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the different options I had. Most of them were. Um, very high waterfalls when I first asked it, but um, I think one of them was a nice low waterfall. I did some research on, you know, finished waterfalls. I didn't see a lot of very tall ones that were accessible easily. So you kind of wanted a small, short waterfall, not a big Yosemite 200 foot style waterfall. The other thing about having hard light in this case is of course it, it creates a lot of contrast between Dave's hoodie and the background, the, the grass. And so as far as okay. cutting, they felt it just becomes so much easier when you have that strong contrast there. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, is that the generative fill is actually adding in some edges around Dave that um, it's actually adding to his hoodie a bit. So it wasn't that hard to composite him. Once I did the generative fill, I did have to play with uh, some of the edges around the ears and then the hat, I think it came out a little funky, but uh, it was pretty quick and fast and then ready to go. All I did was add the uh, noise layers and, Send it back to you. Incredible. All right, let's have a look at image number three. And the third image is different in the sense that it is completely made up. So there was, there was no original image there. So in this image, we're, we're looking at a forest, a pine forest, 
um, with fern and whatnot on the ground and a reindeer hiding amongst the trees. That's what we're looking at. It's a beautiful forest, totally realistic looking forest um, with you know sunlight passing through the trees. Um, but that forest doesn't exist. It never existed. In fact, it's a forest right behind you. Yeah, this is the same same image behind me with my little reindeer. Um, the interesting thing with this one is, is, again, I didn't really know what kind of trees were in Finland, so I did a Google search on that and found that spruce are very common, and so I actually told it to use you know, a Finnish forest with spruce trees and kind of uh, sparsed it up and hopefully got something that was going to be similar. And then I realized that the request was, let's have an animal. So I started thinking about, you know, squirrels and raccoons and that sort of thing, and I went, no, everybody knows the most important and most iconic Finnish animal up there is going to be a reindeer. So um, using gender to fill, I just select, selected the area around the uh, around the tree and told it to drop a reindeer in there. I did have to go through a few different reindeer. Some of them were not anatomically correct, but uh, I ended up with one I liked. And the cool thing was is that it knew there was a tree there and actually placed him behind the tree. So there was a very little editing that I had to do once I had him in there. Um, there was... Sometimes Junior to Phil added additional reindeer or pieces of reindeer. So I still think there's a little bit of work that needs to be done there. But again, you just uh, go in there and mask those guys out. And we got our we got our reindeer in there. It's done an unbelievable job in lighting the reindeer as well, because the sun is basically coming uh, towards us through the trees. And it's lit the reindeer from behind, from the far side. And it's created this, this, um, this halo of light around the edge of the of the reindeer, just as you would expect if it was really there. And it's um, it, it's kept the side of the reindeer that we're actually looking at relatively dark. So it's in shadow, just as it would be if it, if that reindeer was really there. And I'll tell you one thing. I did um, I generated a whole lot of raccoons recently um, in one of my images uh, because, well, why wouldn't I, of course? Everybody knows that I love raccoons, right? It's, it's, it's not a secret anymore. It's out. It's out there. Um, but I would say... The raccoon AI is not as sophisticated as, as I had hoped. <laughs> the raccoons were, uh, well, not that Raccoons great. are a little anthropomorphic shape-wise, and so I think when you're trying to do a raccoon that's not distant, and one of the things that helped here was that I have a distant animal that wasn't so well-defined. Once they start to get close, I notice that uh, generative hill starts to break down a bit. I noticed that especially with human faces, Jinder DeFill does a terrible job at human faces currently. Um, I found sometimes it does real good, and then other times you just get Play-Doh faces that, that don't really look human at all. Um, and of, course, and of that... course, fingers are still a problem with, uh, with Jinder DeFill. Not so much with, say, Mid-Journey or Stable Diffusion. Some of the new Stable Diffusion models are very good at doing hands. But again, I think this is just the nature of the beast. As time progresses, they're going to get better and better. And we'll be doing uh, mid-journey level quality output with generative fill in six months or a year. I, absolutely. How does that progression happen? Does Adobe go, well, you know, generative fill, you suck at raccoons. We're going to have to train you on a whole boatload of raccoon pictures and, you know, in the hope of, of getting a better result next time. Is that how, is that how they do it? Yeah, getting that textual uh, integration where it's getting the image and the text over and over and over again and you're pumping it into the machine, it'll do that. Um, some of the older models actually pitted one model against another. So they actually have the machines um, run against each other and the winner would move on to the next level, so to speak. Um, I'm not exactly sure how and what Adobe software is using. I've heard some rumors that they're actually running a stable diffusion instance. Um, I'm not sure that that's the case. I'd be surprised because it's extremely fast and, and does a good job. Um, stable diffusion is good, but it all depends on the model. Um, so what I think is possibly happening with Adobe is I think just the training data is limited. With uh, Since they're just using the Adobe stock and maybe some additional stock out resources they have, I think the training gain is limited. And so they're going to be limited in what they can generate on the fly. Um, and I think as time progresses and they get a larger group of stock, it's going to just get better. So that's, the solution is, is right there. So if, if, you're, if you're listening or you're, you're watching at the moment and you have a large selection or collection of raccoon images, sell them to Adobe. That's the way forward. Yep. That's the way to do it. Upload them as stock and select them to be added to the database. 
Um, I actually have stock photos available on uh, Adobe Stock, and I went in there recently and checked the ones that were uh, not as popular, that don't get sold as well, so I added them to the uh, stock database. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's the way. Um, but just to remind you know, listeners and viewers, again, this image didn't exist. There was no, It was a blank canvas. It wasn't like we shot you know, the woods here in, in, you know, in the South of England, we didn't, we, that was, there was nothing there. One, one important th aspect of this image, especially, I think, is that um, your prompt really is important. And what you're adding to your prompt is important when it comes to getting just the results you want. In many of these cases, I used a very simple prompt, you know, waterfall, finish waterfall, something like that. In this case, I actually used the word sun dappled. So I really wanted that sort of dappling of sunlight coming through and my original intention from this image was sort of a foggy scene with the sun shooting through the fog when this forest came up i thought this is as good as any and i didn't really want to play too much of photoshop i didn't want to add a bunch of photoshop filters to it i just wanted to see what the gender to fill could do and i think it did a pretty good job again i think as time progresses and we get more artistic images into the database I think we'll be able to generate much more artistic things and tell it hey you know i want this to have a foggier scene or something like that and add them in. See, that just shows you exactly how intelligent this artificial intelligence actually is, because I didn't even know sun devil was even the word. There you go. <laughs> Speed in my brain. <laughs> yeah, I use a lot in, in my corporate office, actually. Uh, in my corporate job, um, I'm a creative director. And I do a lot of large format graphics for our stores. And one of the difficult things is, is hiring a lot of models and then setting, getting a set set up and then getting just the right lighting and then getting the right products into a room, et cetera. Well, with AI, I can generally tell it, hey, I want an attractive mixed race couple on a bed, in a bedroom, in California, with a window showing the California forest, sun dappled room, that's my word, and it generates impressive images right off the bat. And I'm ready to work with those and add, clean them up even more. It's incredible. Um, so. I don't really have an original image to show for, for this one because, well, there just wasn't one, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but it's all about the prompting. It's all about using the right vocabulary to tell AI what it is that you want it to do. And of course, you can refine that. I'm guessing often what would happen is, you know, you prompt, it doesn't really work out. You start refining the prompt until you get to the result that you were after in the, from the beginning. Yeah, this is very true. I think there is um, a couple of other little tricks to keep in mind if you're in the case that we had, we have one image where we have a path running from a doorway, and um, we had a lot of trouble getting the path to work and to get, make it look realistic. In some cases, I think the, uh, the landscape was too wet, and so every time we put down a path, it was adding a river or it was adding logs rather than a dirt path. So one of the cool tricks is is to, instead of superimposing everything together and then running your, your, uh, your generative, you actually pull it out. Do your background first, and then start compositing things together. Um, that's one of the one of the tricks you can learn. Uh, apart from you know the different kinds of masking you can do with Jitter to fill. One of the other things you might want to try is if you want a specific cat in a specific area, is to circle with the lasso tool just the area, just the shape that you want, and tell it what you want in that area, rather than trying to redo the entire image. So that worked for me um, when I was trying to generate a pirate hat. Um, in one of my images. So I turned um, kind of like a woodcutter type of image, like a, like a lumberjack type of image into a pirate image. That was the, that was the, the idea. And initially I had a real problem um, getting generative fill to come up with a, a halfway realistic pirate hat. Not, I, I don't think I was very successful in the end. Anyway, it's still kind of, you know, stuck on, but the initial issue was actually the shape just to get a, you know, a pirate hat shape, right? And one thing I started doing was exactly as you said, you know, I started to outline the exact shape of the pirate hat that I had in mind. Um, and then the results started to get better. Yeah, one other thing I've noticed is that uh, where generative fill doesn't understand, in the example you're giving, it's probably thinking pirate and hat is two different words. It doesn't understand that you want a pirate hat. It's thinking you want a pirate in a hat. And so sometimes, and this isn't always true, but sometimes if you combine the two words together, even if they're not Englishly correct, you know, proper in grammar, uh, it'll actually create exactly what you want. 
because somehow it knows that those two tags are connected and will generate the right image. This is going to work so much better in German because because we put all these words together in the first place. Anyhow, <laughs> this is going to work perfectly. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so we'll have a look at um, the the last image, which is an image of Dave uh, in again in front of a forest in Finland, um, but he's also he's pointing at a log cabin behind him. There's a path leading from the log cabin to to right behind um, behind where, where Dave is standing. So the idea there was that Dave's basically staying at this log cabin and he's pointing at it and we can see it in the background. So that that was an interesting image to generate. Yeah, we generated a, diff a couple of different versions of this and um... One of the interesting things was, was I thought I thought they both looked pretty good. I thought there was a little bit of uh, ambiguity about how it how the images would work together. Um, one of the issues I also foresaw was that as we were going to have an image that was sort of being looking out that door is how to sort of replicate that same landscape from the other side. And I think those are things you want to keep in mind as you're generating images uh, of this type. Um, for example, I think the image we chose has a lot of like dead trees right in front of the cabin. But if you look at the cabin image, you're not going to see those trees. I tried really, really, really hard to create a bunch of dead trees, and I did not come up with anything that even looked quite right. When I told it dead trees, it laid them on the ground. Um, I told it to do a plant, and sometimes it would generate a plant. Sometimes it would just duplicate the landscape. Um, so there is still a lot to learn and a lot of difficulty that can be had here. But... But by and large, I think it did a pretty smash up job. Yeah, that was one of those examples where you know you, you try different things and you keep trying, and at some point, I think I think we said, well, we'll, we'll choose a slightly different image for this particular you know uh, for this this particular Instagram story that we did uh, because the idea with this whole um, vacation thing was to make it look really as realistic as possible, and then just to see whether we get found out. I yeah, I think, you know, some of the some of the interesting things there is that with the AI, what you're able to do is create these images that can fool the eye and uh, present a story. And I think that's going to be useful for image creators and for content creators. I do have some concerns, of course, that we're going to see um, images and we're already seeing images created of things that don't happen and passed as if they did happen. Um, I think we kind of need to guard somehow uh, history and what did happen in history and sort of lock it in place so that as we go back and look at things that didn't happen, uh, images are created and, hey, here's an image of so-and-so next to someone else, um, we, we'll know that those aren't true. Um, I saw recently someone was creating images of, um, I think it was the Cuban Revolution, and they didn't have photography of these events of the Cuban Revolution, so they went and they created them in AI. I thought, well, that's neat. But what does that actually say? Because you can actually change history with that in any way you want. Um, so I think there's a danger there, uh, especially when it comes to you know fake news, uh, that folks will start to um, generate images of things that didn't happen, whether it be UFOs or uh, Bigfoot or you know the Loch Ness monster or you know Fidel Castro hanging out with Joe Biden. These are things that did not happen, probably, right? And you know, especially, and especially. The Loch Ness monster. <laughs> yeah, well, but you know, but if you think about it, I mean, you know, that kind of image manipulation that's been going on since you know since the early days of photography. In fact, you know, the Loch Ness next, I can't even say it, the Loch Ness monster is a really good example for that because of the most yeah. famous image that we have of the Loch Ness monster is a complete fake, and we know that. <laughs> and somebody went through what we would now call practical effects to basically stage that image, you know, and, and of course, well. Now we don't have to get our feet wet anymore. We can just do it on a computer. It's so much easier. But of course, the other thing with that is, is that, you know, up to now, this is probably one of those breaking points in history. Up to now, it was the thing like, well, you know, we have an image of it, then that's going to provide us with proof that something did take place for the most part. I think that's probably something that, you know, courts will have to reconsider <laughs> that type of evidence in the future. Yeah, I recall reading and seeing images of, uh, you know, during the Russian, after the Russian, I recall seeing images of uh, 
taken after the Russian Revolution and of the Communist Party and how they would remove people from images uh, who are no longer part of their political persuasion or who they had sent off to Gulag. Um, I think AI, however, is going to give us a way of doing it in a much more uh, believable way and that will be harder to detect. I know there's some AI detectors out there and there's a, a fellow of folks I follow on to Twitter called Hoax Eye who try to find images that are hoaxes and expose them and they're using this now. And I sent them one of a giant skull with a small uh, paleontologist or anthropologist sitting next to this giant skull. And I created it in mid journey, took it into Photoshop, added a bit of uh, a bit of noise and sent it to him and said, hey, what do you think of this one? He ran it through the detector and it said it was less than 10% chance of it being fake. So he was shocked and sent back, how did you do this, right? So I think, I think the fear is there and I think the potential down the road is going to be real. What I do think is interesting is that the different models between stable diffusion models, mid journey and Adobe, they all create very different looking images. Um, and I do think Adobe's generative fill has a very stock look to it where mid journey is very stylistic and um, uh, almost overly stylistic in some cases. And then with all the different models you can choose from when it comes to stable diffusion, you can generate a model of any kind you want. I think what I'm looking forward to, especially with generative fill is down the road, we're going to be able to change a photograph into a painting quite easily um, or into an illustration. I saw a demonstration of this recently. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time, but you can actually go into Stable Diffusion, create a, take a photo in the Stable Diffusion, uh, create a, a little mask that is, you know, 50 to 60% fill, run Stable Diffusion, just say oil painting, and it'll take whatever is there and turn it into an oil painting. Now, it's big brush strokes and that sort of thing, but it actually does a pretty neat job. And I think there's some uh, a lot of potential that we haven't even scratched, you know, haven't even seen yet. And we've only scratched the surface of what generative fill and the Adobe's AI system is going to be able to do. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, I joined a discussion um, only last week at my local camera club um, about the effects of AI on photography and uh, especially photography competitions and categories and so on and so forth. And um, it was, it's quite a, it's quite a, I mean, it was a, a difficult discussion because really, you know, I think this subject or this topic has been around only for such little time. And, and most people are trying to wrap their head around what's happening. What's your stance on that? Yeah, I'm, I used to tell everybody, I, you know, in, in one of my, one of the things I tell folks about my photos is that they're all touched by me with Photoshop or Lightroom. My best-selling photo of Mount Shasta was taken in a day where the skies were gray and the morning was not that spectacular. Um, I came home and threw it into Lightroom and played with the colors and I came up with this amazing image. And the image has been used now by cell phone manufacturers as a default background. It's my highest selling image on Adobe stock. And I look at it and I love the image, but I'm always reminded, hey, it didn't really look like that when I was there. And I think we have to recognize as photographers, as artists, that we're always interpreting things and everything we do is interpreted, whether it be from the camera lens interpreting the image. For example, I use a Sony camera and the Sony camera takes specific kinds of images. What's interesting is I can tell a Sony image when someone has uh, retouched it and put it up online. I can look at that image and go, I can tell that that's a Sony image by the color of the sun. Um, by the by, the certain you know lens flare you get, you can tell whether it's a Sony and what lens they use. Um, so everything's interpreted. Our own eyes interpret colors slightly differently. Um, so one argument against the fear of AI is that, like photography was for painters, um, and like digital photography was for film photographers, this is just another step in the evolution of technology that's going to help us create more. Um, there are ethical discussions, there's ethical concerns, and I think that's some good discussions to have. But this is a tool, and like any tool, it can be used for good or for bad. And uh, hopefully we can, we've shown people how to use it for uh, mischief and for good. And of course, that was exactly why we decided to, to go ahead with this particular, you know, with this vocation project. How do you think it went all in? I think it went pretty well. I don't. I didn't see, but maybe one comment that suggested that anybody noticed that this was fake. I think the fact that these were sort of off the cuff, um, selfie style photos helped that a lot. Um, people are seeing those and just kind of 
absorbing them rather than looking at them critically. Um, if we had taken, you know, this is a photo I took of, you know, the fjord and the, the, the northern lights and this and that, and we had faked that, I think it would have been pretty quick and easy to, to determine. Um, I've seen a lot of people trying to do AI images of like the night sky, and you look at it and you're going, nebulas don't look like that, the stars don't look like that, the Milky Way is completely out of place. Um, so I think it helps that we were using sort of uh, amateur style photography for this. I think if we had gone for the professional, it would have been a little less successful. Yeah, that was, in fact, you know, that was the thought process right from the beginning. Um, in order to make it appear as real as possible, the situation in which those images were taken had to, uh, had to be as real as possible. Meaning that, you know, if you're on a trip, you're traveling, you know, you're flipping out your, your iPhone or whatever, and you take some, some random shots of yourself, they're not going to be photographic masterpieces. They're going to be snapshots for the most part. And that's exactly what these images needed to be. And I think everything put together, the original shot, you know, the, the method of creating the fakes and, and also placing that in a narrative that sort of makes sense because a lot of it was just, the narrative was, you know, Dave's on a trip to Finland, which seems that in itself seems perfectly realistic because we all know that Dave travels in particular to Northern climates like, you know, Scandinavia and the Arctic and so on. So for him to go on a trip to Finland, that in itself sounds perfectly plausible. We all believe that, you know, in fact, we'd be surprised if he wasn't in Finland or someplace, you know? Um, and so, so that in itself, so, you know, you're setting the scene. And I think it's a little bit like, you know, like magicians when, you know, when they, when they come up with this trick, that's basically just fooling you. It's they're basing it in some kind of narrative that appears to be perfectly plausible. And so we're not questioning it. And because we right. didn't question the fact that, that it sounded perfectly plausible for, for Dave to be on the road, you know, the scene was set for us to be fooled. And then actually, you know, I think we would just believe anything we were given at that point, you know? So, so yeah, it was a, it was a really interesting, interesting experience. Of course, you know, we had to come clean in the end. But, you know, some of the best generations I saw, I thought, uh, Dave's airplane photo where he's in the airplane and he's sitting there and the rows of seats are behind him. Um, apart from the screaming babies and things, I thought the photo was extremely well done. And for me, I'm thinking when I first saw it, did he actually take that on a plane? And then I'm looking at some of the details. And if you look closely at the details, you'll see, yeah, there's this and that's out of place. But it's so well done that, you know, on, a, on just passing by it, you're not going to know. The other one that I thought was well done, of course, was the lake one that I did with the rock. Um, I just, that rock and everything just came together so well. Yeah, I mean, uh, th again, it's such a plausible situation, you know, a lake, you know, pine trees, a rock, Dave in front of it. Makes perfect sense, you know. We, you know, and what, what also helps is, of course, that in the past, we would have seen Dave in these scenarios. Actually, so there's, there's a bit of that sort of memory effect, um, you know, if it were somebody like me who really never travels well, that's actually not true, but you know, if you saw me all of a sudden, like, you know, on a, on a husky sleigh somewhere in the Arctic, most people would think like, well, we know, you know, K in his beach body. That's, <laughs> that's not completely unrealistic, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it's, uh, it was, it was tremendous fun putting this together. Of course, the whole idea was for us to come clean in the end. And, uh, and thank you so much. Um, for coming on the show and explaining exactly how some of those images were made. Thank you so much, Michael. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I had a great time. And uh, anytime you guys want to go somewhere else, let me know. That was good. That was amazing. Um, every time I see Michael's work, I'm blown away. Mm. Um, what it does do, though, I think, it's it just shows you how easy it is. I mean, as you said at the beginning... AI does what people thought Photoshop did anyway. Mm. And that's true to an extent because, you know, compositing things isn't a new thing. Mm. Um, compositing things really well isn't a new thing. Mm. Yeah. We, we see it on movie posters and, and, you know, and absolutely everywhere. But, but doing it without any... Like click a button, done. Yeah. yeah. 
We're doing it without any expertise necessary and simply uttering the words. Oh, well, you still have to type them. I'm sure that's the thing of the past soon as well. What we could do now is we could both look at the camera, take a quick screenshot, and then click a button, and there could be a raccoon in between us. You're going to do that. Oh, now I have to. Now he has to. <laughs> so it's, it's just astonishing how easy it is. And therefore, it's also alarming how easy it is. Yeah. And with, I think you said it when we were having a whiskey the other day quite well, even if you did suddenly turn into Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. And this is a technology that needs to be used responsibly because it it does potentially have life-changing life-threatening consequences if you use it wrong if you if you were to depict a situation so bad that somebody felt some kind of psychological response that they might want to change make it make a dangerous decision let's put it that way make a dangerous decision based on what they're seeing in an image that is not real but they think it's real this is a very dangerous place and it needs to be regulated i think there should be warnings about when an ai created image is used that says this is and uh, this is not real social media kind of has a trending hashtag which is hashtag ai art where people are tagging their ai creations so that people know this is ai but it's not an, it's not mandatory people are just doing it um i don't know to 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 show that it's not real out of courtesy um but i, I think this is a very dangerous area the the big argument is whether it's gonna you know whether that robot's gonna come and steal my job don't care about that i'm more interested in deceiving people and the consequences it's going to have and i hope it doesn't take for something terrible to happen before it's regulated but i feel like no one's really getting a grip of it yet i think it's it's interesting to see how fast this technology is improving hmm. um you know i remember well, i mentioned it earlier um, I spoke to I spoke to Mike in November. Um, Dali had made the news in the August prior. Mm -hmm. So between that happening and me talking to Mike, the world had changed completely in terms of AI. And you know, Dali was already old news. You know, mm -hmm. um, and then from November to now, we now ha we now have those kind of capabilities inside of Photoshop, which I don't think anybody could have foreseen back then. Well, probably the guys had. I I, I didn't really see it coming. So. so yeah. It, you know, and now we're still, we're in beta, it isn't even in the actual public release. Mm. But just imagine what this is going to be like in a year from now, in two years from now, in five years from now, in ten years from now. So the big one, we, we said it earlier, hands, eyes, things like that, it's not very good at. Um, and um, Dali, Dali 2, is pretty perfect with them now. It was terrible, and it's now perfect, and it's been... Nine months. Yeah. Let's say nine months. So where is Adobe Generative Fill going to be in six months? I think it will be there. I think there will be. Yeah. Hands will be fine. Eyes will be fine. You won't have two pupils in one eye. Um, everyone will have the right number of limbs in the right places. I don't think it's going to take long until it's pretty perfect. Yeah. And of course, the counter argument is, is that from an, you know, from an artistic point of view, it's amazing because you can yeah. create anything you can see in your mind's eye. Yeah. Um, but of course, when you put it in balance with, you know, the, the use cases, so to say, you know, because you can use it to create great art mm -hmm. on the flip side, you can use it to deceive yeah. whoever's looking at it. Um, and that's really, that's the thing that's, that's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to police. I think we're, I always compare it to Napster, the old Napster mm -hmm. comparison, you know, um, we we'll talked about this a little bit earlier, but in my mind, this is something you know, we're looking at, at the moment, we don't really quite understand how we're going to deal with it. Mm. 
But I'm pretty sure that in 10 years' time, we're going to look back at this and we're going to think, well, yeah, it's fairly obvious, you know, this is how we did it and this is how we regulated it. And just like we now look at Spotify. Look back from within our sort of robot bodies oh yeah with our mind implanted into it <laughs> exactly well, that's it <laughs> that's it they're just making us think what they want us to mm-hmm. you know, that's the thing anyway it'd be interesting to hear your opinions on this whole thing uh we've done a few episodes about ai it's just simply because it's the hot potato right now um but let me know what you think do you think ai generative fill all that kind of stuff is a danger to society and you know our days are numbered or do you think it's just the greatest thing for art um, that has happened in the last hundred years? Um, get in touch. You can uh, message us on Instagram. Um, you can message us on Facebook. If you're not part of our Facebook group, why not? That's my question. Why aren't you? Head over to Facebook. Even if you don't use Facebook for anything else, that's really worth uh, well worth joining. Anyhow. Cool. <laughs> Let's stop it there and I'll actually do the actual closer. You mentioned him flatter pod. Um no, not in this one because I need to really make Because he know. wants to he wants to start giving you money in it, like ten in, in ten days. Oh okay. Cool. <laughs> um oh shit. Um okay, so what I'll do is I'll put I'll put um I'll put the lower third sentence, I've not changed those to platypod for this one. I want to create like a little ad that I can run in the middle of it. You know, just like I did for a DV store. And we'll have to talk about that as well, by the way. All right, cool. Let's just do this bit. Okay, folks, that's all for today. This has literally blown my mind. And if you like this episode, let me recommend another two episodes that I think you'd like. Episode 156, where we test Photoshop's generative fill to the limit. And episode 130 with Micah Berg, where we look at artificial intelligence through the eyes of an expert. I'm sure you love it. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version, and for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fleshed video version on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor? Well, if you've been listening, then you know. All you have to do is to go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you are on YouTube already, Get in touch and leave a comment and remember to hit the like button, ring the bell and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching and I'll see you next Thursday.